Janet Hill with the Rock Island County Health Department. Thank you for joining us. It's 3.30 p.m. on April 13th. Today we have with us Dr. Katt uh, from the Scott County Health Department, Amy Thorson from the Scott County Health Department, and Nita Ludwig from the Rock Island County Health Department. Dr. Katz is here to talk about the Johnson & Johnson announcement today, but first we will have some numbers and some uh, reminders from both Nita and Amy. So Nita, let's start off, please. Today in Rock Island County, we have 46 new cases of COVID-19, which brings our total to 13,860. We do have 25 people currently hospitalized in Rock Island County with COVID-19. And sadly, we do have an additional death of a resident of our county, a woman in her 90s who had been in long-term care. And we send our sympathies to her and her family members. Our total deaths now is at 311 in Rock Island County. In Scott County, there have been 20,122 positive cases of co coronavirus, COVID-19. Um, that's up 430 tests from last week. We are at 234 deaths, with one death being reported in the last week. Okay, Nita, we can first go ahead and hear your prepared information for today. Today is the fifth week anniversary of the opening of the National Guard Assisted Vaccination Clinic at the Camden Center in Milan. The dedicated soldiers, contract nurses, uh, and health department managers, staff, and volunteers have combined to give thousands of vaccines. Today, we are giving some updates and reminders about the clinics in Milan. First of all, you've probably heard about the nationwide pause in administering the one dose Johnson & Johnson vaccine. And a little later, Dr. Louis Katz will help us understand why the FDA and CDC have recommended this move. The Rock Island County Health Department had planned to give Johnson & Johnson vaccine at this Thursday's clinic in Milan, and now we will be giving Moderna vaccine instead. Those who are signed up for Thursday's clinic will receive their first dose of the Moderna vaccine there and all of the appointments that were previously made will be honored for that. The Milan Clinic is an appointment-based clinic. Walk-ins will usually be turned away because we have the number of doses planned out for each of those days. You must bring your vaccination card if it is your second dose appointment. You could be turned away without it and you might be sent back to get it and you can return later that day and we will honor your appointment. To sign up for an appointment, you can visit richd.org or the Rock Island County Health Department's Facebook page. And there will be the links for a clinic you can sign up for. You will need to present your QR code that you receive at the time you register to the clinic. Once you see an appointment calendar notification, you must scroll down and hit the submit button. The appointment is not made until you click the submit button. You will know you have made an appointment when you receive that QR code. You also must make an appointment the same day for your second dose, the same way, excuse me, for your second dose. You do not have to get your second dose at the Camden site if another day is available to you and within the second dose window, you can take that. Our pharmacy partners and other partners also have weekend and evening appointments available. As a reminder, the optimal window for the Moderna vaccine is 28 to 42 days. And for the Pfizer vaccine, it's 21 to 42 days. Most of the time, the Moderna vaccine will be offered on Monday through Wednesday with the Pfizer vaccine offered on Friday and Saturday at the Camden Center. Thursday could be either vaccine depending on our availability. We ask that you pay close attention to the title of the registration link. We usually only have one brand of vaccine on hand at the Camden site at any time. You should receive both doses of the same brand of vaccine. The Pfizer vaccine is the only one given emergency use authorization for teens that are age 16 and 17. 
a parent or guardian must consent for the child to receive the vaccine. Pfizer has asked the FDA to give emergency use authorization for children as young as 12 to receive the vaccine, but this approval has not yet been given. We expect that the same request will come from Moderna in the coming weeks. Before arriving at your appointment, please make sure that you eat or drink something before getting your vaccination. Having a meal before the vaccine could help those with a history of fainting and water prevents dehydration. To date, almost 77,000 vaccine doses have been administered in Rock Island County and more than 31,000 people are fully vaccinated. Our pharmacy and healthcare partners also have appointments available throughout the area. To find locations, visit coronavirus.illinois.gov slash s slash vaccinations dash location or vaccinefinder.org. While most everyone is focused on getting vaccinated, we can't forget that we are still in the middle of the pandemic. Widespread vaccination is what will get us to the other side of the pandemic, but it's only one of the tools to prevent more infection. Even if you've been fully vaccinated, you must continue to wear a mask and keep your six foot distance from others. We also must continue washing our hands, and this is good advice even without the pandemic. We know you're tired of the pandemic and we are too. Please help us get to the end of it by getting vaccinated as soon as you can. We have many appointments available each week at the Camden Center and our pharmacy and healthcare partners have open slots too. Our last tidbit, vaccine variations, our partnership with the Quad City Symphony Orchestra starts tomorrow. The, these world-class musicians will perform twice a week for one hour each day at the Camden Center. The last performance is scheduled for May 20th. We hope these performances will bring some much needed joy during these anxiety filled days. Thank you. Thank you, Nita. Now go ahead, Amy. To date in Scott County, the vast majority of the 108,000 doses of vaccine that have been provided by Scott County providers has been Pfizer and Moderna vaccine. And we have been expecting that to continue. We are in continuing to encourage members of our community to access the vaccine that is most available to them. Our local healthcare and pharmacy partners continue to have appointments available through their Pfizer and Moderna vaccine supplies. We know that the coronavirus variants continue to circulate and we are still seeing a higher number of cases than we were seeing in more recent weeks. While we keep one eye on the next steps for the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, we must keep our other eye on what we can control in this pandemic. And that is wearing a mask, social distancing, washing our hands, and staying home when we're sick. Now I'll turn it over to Dr. Katz to discuss the pause in Johnson & Johnson vaccine administration. Thanks, Amy. Um, yeah, so uh, I got up this morning uh, in time to uh, get a health alert network notice uh, of this pause. There was really uh, no warning, but I think this is not a great surprise to people who've been following developments uh, with vaccination over the past several weeks. So the CDC and Food and Drug Administration have received uh, six reports to the Vaccine Adverse Events Reporting System of a rare blood clotting disorder that is associated in time with getting the J&J &J COVID-19 vaccine. These reports describe blood clots, especially in the veins uh, of, of the brain, uh, associated uh, with a low platelet count. Platelets are the small cell fragments in the bloodstream uh, that initiate and support normal uh, blood clotting. No cases have been reported from Scott County or Iowa to date, uh, and I've inquired about Illinois but haven't heard yet. Again, we're talking about six cases in the entire country. 
FDA, CDC, the Iowa and Illinois Departments of Health in Scott County and Rock Island County are all in accord recommending in an abundance of caution, pausing the use of this vaccine, this vaccine only, it's the only one of the three affected, for two reasons that are grounded in our commitment to uh, both safety and transparency. First, we wanna be sure that we understand the nature of the process, its relationship to the vaccine and, and, uh, and its frequency. And second, we need time to alert the public and especially healthcare providers to the unique nature of these events to be sure that appropriate evaluation and treatment are understood and offered. The duration that this pause will be in effect is not known, but it's anticipated to be days, not weeks, uh, at this very early point. The CDC's independent expert panel, the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices, will meet an emergency session tomorrow at noon local time to review the data available and recommend next steps. These six cases have occurred among almost 7 million recipients of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. The rate is about one in a million 200,000 doses at this point. None have been reported in almost 120 million doses of Moderna and Pfizer mRNA vaccines given in the US alone. The reaction looks very much like uh, a number that have been seen with the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine in the European Union, although it is not yet proven that the reactions are identical. Uh, my review of the available data suggests very strongly that this is a single process involving both vaccines. What's, what appears to be happening is that rare patients immunized with the J&J vaccine, in addition to making an immune response to SARS-CoV-2, make an immune response that activates their platelets, causing spontaneous blood clotting. Both the AstraZeneca and J&J vaccines are based on adenovirus vectors and there is speculation that it may be related to the adenovirus formulations used in the two vaccines. Very sophisticated testing is needed to prove the relationship and the usual treatments for blood clotting, certain blood thinners, especially heparin, may be very dangerous to these patients. So consultation with a blood coagulation expert is critical as soon as the diagnosis is suspected. In the United States so far, women between 18 and 48 years of age have been affected with the onset of their reactions between six and 13 days after getting the vaccine dose. No other risk information is yet available. One of the six patients has died. One is in critical condition. Individuals who have received the J&J vaccine in a time frame from seven to 21 days or so need to be alert to symptoms that might suggest blood clots. These include new pain and swelling in the legs, especially if it's only on one side, new shortness of breath or chest pain, new severe abdominal pain, severe headache or other neurologic symptoms. If these symptoms develop in that time frame of seven to 21 days after receiving J&J &J vaccine, they should call their healthcare provider with the information, including the date they received the vaccine. I wanna reiterate the Pfizer, Pfizer and Moderna vaccines are not associated with this reaction, are not included in the recommended pause. We remain committed to broad vaccination of the population as a critical step to control the pandemic. And people should get the first vaccine for which they are eligible as soon as they can do so. 
As Nita said, social and physical distancing, masking, high hand, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, hand hygiene, and limiting non-essential travel are, remain the essential non-pharmacologic interventions that are highly effective at preventing COVID-19. Uh, that's what I've prepared and we can do Q&A now, I suppose. Please, if any of our media partners have questions for any of the speakers, put it on there now. Um, Dr. Katz, is there anything you'd like to say about what you're seeing with cases? I know you do our um, epi curve each week. What are we seeing right now? We've been kind of sounding the alarm on the rise that we have been noticing. Yeah, so the 1st of March, we were down around 10 cases per 100,000 per day in the county. And we're now at about 35 per 100,000 per day in the county. So more than triple. And the test positive rate likewise has tripled. So we're in our, uh, our, uh, our fourth wave. Um, it's a little too early to tell, but the rate of increase since March 1st maybe starting to slow, but it's too early to say. So uh, um, we're seeing way more than we were at the beginning of March. Uh, and we believe that that's related to pandemic fatigue, uh, bad behavior, lack of masking, uh, perhaps related to the dominant UK strain uh, that we know is about 50% more transmissible uh, than the original strains. Uh, so yeah, we're not in a good place. Question related to those strains. Do we know if there is a relationship between the UK or other variants and the rise of hospitalizations in our area? And can you comment on the fact that younger people in their 60s, 50s and 60s are landing in the hospital? Uh, I got data from Genesis from the entire system yesterday. Uh, and the increase in hospitalizations is related to the increase in infection rates. The increase in infection rates is related to both the variant and to some relaxation of non-pharmaceutical interventions that, uh, that we've seen recently. Um, the age distribution, both of cases uh, in the county and of hospitalized patients shows that they are getting younger. That is largely due to the high rates of vaccination among high-risk elderly, while the proportion of younger patients in the hospital is higher, the absolute number of younger patients in the hospital is pretty stable. So uh, it's, uh, the, the shift to younger hospitalization is more relative than real. Amy and Nita, um, next question. Do you know how many individuals in Scott and Rock Island County have received the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, both counties, excuse me, uh, before this pause? Hi, this is Nita. So I can say that Johnson & Johnson, we had not gotten very uh, much of an allocation of Johnson & Johnson to this point. So for Rock Island County Health Department, it would have been probably under a thousand doses here from Rock Island County Health Department, but I cannot uh, speak to how much the pharmacies or other healthcare providers may have gotten. In Scott County, um, we too had not received a lot of the vaccine. So um, Scott County Health Department gave less than a thousand doses of that vaccine. You can get the numbers on the coronavirus.iowa.gov. It, it shows the number of doses provided in the county by Scott County providers, as well as the doses um, received by Scott County residents. Um, and that's 3,200 residents, approximately 3,800 doses overall. So um, still relatively small in comparison to the number of doses that have been given. But we too don't know all the providers that are receiving vaccine through the national partnerships uh, with direct allocations. Dr. Katz, next question for you. What do you think this Johnson & Johnson pause does for the anti-vaxxers arguments? We're seeing comments like the government was telling us to hurry up and get vaccinated. Now they're saying to wait. What do you think this will do to those folks' opinions that may already have been on the fence on vaccination? 
Well, we have concern about that, but the government is not telling anybody to wait to get vaccinated. To the contrary, the government is saying, as we have been saying all along, get the first vaccine for which you are, are eligible as soon as you can get it. This pause reflects only the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. And I've looked at the data very carefully from the European Union. And at the rate that we see this, the risk from COVID still remains far higher in almost all circumstances than the risk from the J&J &J vaccine. Uh, there, we will identify risk factors over the next short period of time. I assume that we will do as the European Union has done with the AstraZeneca vaccine and recommend excluding certain high risk age cohorts uh, from receiving the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. Uh, as a male age 70, if I, could, if, if I hadn't already been vaccinated, and I was offered the J&J &J vaccine today, knowing what I know, I would roll up my sleeve and take it. This is a temporary pause while we identify and characterize exactly what's happening, who's at risk, and modify our recommendations for use of the J&J &J vaccine. It's a great vaccine. This is a rare side effect. The risk of COVID is far higher than the risk from the vaccine. Dr. Katz, earlier today, you were mentioning um, the benefits of the surveillance system, such as vSafe that people might be familiar with, as well as VAERS that you had mentioned. Do you want to talk about the role that it plays in the continuing rollout of these vaccines? Yeah, so there, uh, I have an inventory on a slide that I use somewhere, I can't remember. There are, mm, can't remember the number. Uh, uh, I believe it's eight or 10 formal surveillance systems uh, being used in the United States, a wide variety uh, that really cover vaccinated populations very, very well. And they all then feed into VAERS, the Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System. Uh, and, uh, and they have revealed uh, in a very short period of time uh, an apparent associated adverse event occurring at this point in less than one in a million vaccine recipients. And I think um, it's always worthwhile to look for, for the bright side of every story. Uh, that's an incredibly sensitive uh, surveillance system. And I think it's a big success of this vaccine rollout that we've been able to identify this issue uh, at a rate of uh, less than one in a million. Thank you. Um, any new information on transmission among children in schools? Are we still certain little transmission is occurring in school settings as the governor suggests? Well, it's not the governor suggesting that. It's data that's been accumulated since for, for the past year. We have one surveillance project ongoing in a local high school uh, and rates in school-aged children remain very low. I'm in discussions with uh, the State Hygienic Laboratory about the possibility that we can do some interesting wastewater surveillance related to the schools uh, over the coming weeks uh, that would um, strengthen our uh, sense that school-aged children um, are not highly involved in transmission. That said, uh, uh, school-aged children do become infected school-aged children do transmit both to each other and to uh, um, their older contacts. So it remains critical in the schools to maintain uh, the interventions we're using currently, primarily physical distancing, masking, uh, hand hygiene, and environmental disinfection, especially masking and physical distancing. Things look pretty good in the schools. Um, I do believe it's safe to hold face to face as long as we're able to maintain masking and a minimum three feet distance. COVID resources are focusing more on vaccination. How are the county health departments keeping testing available while running vaccina vaccination sites? Um, 
Amy or Nita, would you like to respond to um, where testing is happening and how that's separate from vaccinations? Sure. Um, in Scott County, the Scott County Health Department has never been doing testing for COVID-19. Um, that's, that's not been our, we're not a primary care healthcare provider. We don't have some of those services available. And we've had a very strong response of our community partners. So testing is available through private healthcare providers, uh, through community healthcare, and then Scott County continues to have a test Iowa site where any, um, any Iowa resident can make an appointment and receive uh, a PCR test in a drive-through testing location. They receive results uh, usually within 24 hours. And so that is at the former Sears store in the, at the North Park Mall in the automotive area. You do have to go online to make an appointment. Um, and I think it's testiowa.gov or com. In Rock Island County, we have not done the COVID-19 testing here at the health department either. We have had the state site here several times over the last several months, um, but we have not had them here recently. However, the same is true in Rock Island County. We have many pharmacy partners that can do COVID-19 testing, as well as community healthcare and private healthcare providers as well. Thank you. Looks like we don't have any additional questions at this time, so we will go ahead and conclude today's briefing. Thank you, Dr. Katz, as always, for sharing information in such a timely manner, same day as we received that, so we're grateful for that. I know there's a lot of information shared today. We will be posting the recording of this on our um, Facebook page as well as on our website, so if you need additional information, you can feel free to go there. Um, we do anticipate talking to you again next week unless there are any large changes that we need to make available to you. So thank you everyone for your time today and we look forward to talking with you again soon.